Good morning, everybody. Um, I'll give about 20 seconds, 30 seconds, just for everybody to uh, organize themselves and we'll kickstart this session. Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Jean Swart and I'm a principal architect with uh, Red Hat. Um, I work in the Sub-Saharan Africa region, uh, predominantly working with dev shops, customers, uh, and partners around modern architectures. Um, and today we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, integration architecture in, in this new cloud native world. Um, and uh, we're going to be focusing a little bit on, on a very special uh, integration project uh, that, that I've been a part of uh, called Apache Camel. Um, and, and we'll talk also a little bit about uh, some of the technology uh, solutions and projects, uh, frameworks that you can use around Apache Camel uh, to help us with uh, all of that uh, integration uh, groundwork that, that we need to do. So just a little bit around uh, my agenda for today. Uh, we'll have a look at what is Apache Camel. We'll look a little bit about the newly released Apache Camel 3. Uh, we'll have a look at how integration architecture has evolved over time. Then we'll stop a little bit uh, and look at serverless architectures for integration alongside some very cool uh, new projects up in the community around Camel K, um, Camel Caucus. Uh, we'll have a little bit of a look about the Camel Kafka connector. And um, when the slide is shared at the uh, end of uh, DevConf, uh, there will be some links at the end of this, which you can then go to and click through and, and get your hands on all of these uh, uh, technologies. So just let me firstly start off by saying everything that I will talk about today is open source. Um, it's freely available for you to download and play and deploy into any Kubernetes or OpenShift cluster. And, uh, so you can get your hands on this and uh, feel, please feel free to reach out to me um, at any point in time. If you guys want to, to, to me to help you uh, getting set up, et cetera, et cetera. So let's uh, quickly just uh, take a, a, a minute here to talk about uh, what is a camel or Apache camel. Um, so I think the first thing to say is think of it as the Swiss army knife of integration needs. Um, it's a very active uh, community project. It's one of the most active Apache projects out there. Um, it com comes with around 12 plus years of development, active development, and it's still very much an active uh, project today and more relevant uh, than ever. So it's really a giant a Swiss army knife uh, and it's packed with functionality and it can address uh, all of your integration needs, uh, regardless of where you are in your integration journey, whether you are still in the traditional integration architectures like we'll see in a minute here, or whether you've gone to microservices, or whether you've actually started playing with uh, serverless architectures. So Apache Camel can help you with that. So just uh, a very simple example of what is an integration framework like Camel, uh, uh, where does it fit in? So basically, if we want to integrate two different systems, uh, you want to send a message from one system to another, um, you would need something in the middle to, to help you with some of these things around routing and mediation and transformation. Um, and that is exactly where, where Camel comes in as that glue between these disparate systems. So just in short, yes, Apache Camel is a Java-based integration framework, um, but it's got amazing support for different runtimes. So you can actually run Camel on your choice of runtime underneath it. So you can see that it runs amazingly well on Spring Boot if you're using Spring Boot. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about Apache Camel on Caucus, this brand new uh, project that we are launching in, in the Java world to make Java relevant in the serverless world. You can run it on a JE platform. You can run it in a micro profile. You can even run it on an OGI platform like Apache Carafe. And of course, you can run it in standalone mode and there's some more out there as well. 
this framework, uh, Apache Camel, came to be based on a, a book that was written many, many years ago called Enterprise Integration Patterns. And if you're in the integration space, I really do urge you to go out uh, and buy this book and, and read it. It's, it's an amazing asset of, of patterns around enterprise integration. Then Apache Camel comes with around 300 plus components or what we call connectors to connect to different systems and platforms out there, um, which makes it really relevant in terms of, of you know, connecting these systems because you can actually interact with them. There's two ways of actually expressing yourself in terms of a what we call a camel route. A camel route is, is this piece of glue that sits between the systems. Um, and we do that with a domain-specific language, and you can express that domain-specific language either in Java or in XML via Spring uh, to, to kind of express yourself in that. And then lastly, um, you know, Apache Camel can, can really almost integrate anything out there. So it's, it's a vital tool in your toolbox as an integration developer. So let's have a quick look at an example of a very, very simple integration route, a camel route. So there's two examples on the screen right now. The first one is a Java-based DSL, and the second one is an XML-based DSL. And you can see it's literally as easy as saying, from this file source, um, push this message to a JMS uh, queue. And it looks uh, very similar in the XML world. Of course, this can get more complicated but it's really a very uh, easy way to express your integration needs uh, through this DSL. So Apache Camel 3 is the new version of Camel that was launched a, a couple of months ago. Um, and it's really an effort from, from the Camel committers to, to, to make Camel relevant in the Kubernetes world, as well as in the serverless world. Um, so Camel 3, is really where we started splitting out Camel into, into smaller spin-off projects. Of course, we'll have the Camel Core, which is still the Swiss uh, knife of integration. Um, and then we have Camel Spring Boot, so that is running Camel on Spring Boot. We have Camel Carafe for running Camel on OSGI. We have Camel K, which is for running Camel on Kubernetes and Knative. If you guys are not aware of, uh, of the Knative project, that is for running serverless workloads uh, on Kubernetes. <clears throat> and then we've got the new kid on the block called Camel Caucus. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Caucus later, supersonic subatomic Java, uh, where we're running Camel in an optimized JVM or in native compiled Java on the Grohl VM. And then lastly, uh, uh, very fresh, we have the Camel Kafka connector which helps you uh, uh, integration between uh, using Camel in conjunction with uh, Kafka. So what I want to do now a little bit is just uh, take some time to look at uh, where we've come from in terms of the integration uh, landscape and how integration architectures has actually evolved over time. This was the Camel website about 10 years ago. I think the screenshot was taken from uh, November 2009. And you can see that Apache Camel, uh, albeit a very old looking uh, website, has been a, a long, uh, around for a very long time. And uh, what we addressed back then was really the SOA world. So, uh, you know, uh, service oriented architectures, but the project has come a long way since then. So if we quickly look at these integration architectures and how they have evolved, and by the way, this does not mean that you are necessarily on the latest and greatest architectures right now. The point being is that Camel can help you regardless of what your integration architecture is today. So if you are still on a server-based architecture, you can absolutely use a Camel today and it's absolutely relevant. Um, but it's also relevant for these others that I'll discuss now. So back in the day, about 10 years ago, when we had service-oriented architectures, um, you can remember Martin Fowler talking about this concept of uh, smart pipes and dumb endpoints. We had ESDs in the middle, uh, where we had these very lightweight services uh, on the side. Um, and we had, uh, you know, these integration committees where 
if you had an integration requirement or use case, you had to get approval from the ESB team and, and they would build that integration in the ESB for us. And the, 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 the line of business development teams could not really build those integrations themselves. So um, that is where we started. Um, and we used products like, there's many out there, but we, we used uh, products like Apache Service Mix along with the Spring Framework and ActiveMQ. Uh, and then we used JBI binding components to connect to our data sources. And we used things like Apache CXF to expose the web services. And uh, we used Camel for the routing and Quartz for the scheduling. and uh, rules for the business rules. So this should really look very familiar to you if you have been in the integration space for a long time. If you're fresh on the block in terms of, of uh, development and integration, maybe this is not so familiar. Um, but many of us are still working with architectures out there at customers that still use uh, SOA and ESB based architectures. So if you think about today's uh, ESB architecture, you can see that it is mostly broken into the three tiers, being uh, the core, which is the runtime. In this specific scenario, I'm using the OSGI framework or Apache Graph, and you have all these components that will take care of uh, the underlying framework. And then you have your integration tier, which as I said before, would be managed by Apache Camel, CXF and ActiveMQ and you would have your applications on the top tier that would actually interact with this uh, ESB. The big problem with the ESB architecture is that number one, um, it was not agile enough. Uh, we had big bottlenecks both in terms of corporate governance because you had to get approvals to the ESB, you had to deploy these new uh, ESB routes in the ESB, you had to wait for these windows and of course of uh, course, secondly, these ESBs were very costly, they didn't scale very well, um, and they were monolith, right? So they usually were one big ESB deployment somewhere at your customer or at your workplace, and uh, they very quickly became a bottleneck for innovation, um, which uh, kind of got us thinking about new architectures uh, out of that. And then, of course, and around the 2003 timeframe uh, with uh, uh, the microservices architecture, we kind of switched that up and we said, well, um, let's, let's move a little bit of the application concerns into the infrastructure world. Um, uh, and we, we're going on this concept of smart endpoints and dumb pipes. So we get rid of the ESB, um, we build the integration logic into the endpoints, uh, whether that be a web service or an end system. And, and we try and do the integration work as close to the actual application as possible. There's some very good benefits to this, uh, meaning we can get, uh, uh, you know, process isolation, a single responsibility, a deployability, scalability of independent microservices. So many, many of my customers and, 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 and people and, and, and industries that I work with out there today are still very much into the microservices architecture. Some of them are actually just starting with that. Um, so it's a very good um, architecture if you compare it to the service-oriented architecture, and there's, there's a lot of benefits that you can get to that. Yeah. Of course, the, along with new architectures comes that you need to skill up your team on these concepts and your architecture teams and your infrastructure teams and your developer teams now need to work together in true DevOps fashion. But uh, what we saw with the microservices architecture is that it, it really provided us with, with those benefits of agility and moving fast and putting the integration responsibility back into the actual teams that are developing uh, uh, these systems. So what I would call microservice architecture 1.0 is where we, you would use something like Apache Camel to configure your integration routes and uh, we will uh, uh, you know, connect Camel to these systems and Camel will do its magic, um, connect to the cloud, connect to your data sources and your enterprise systems and it will, it will, it will do its magic. But uh, uh, there was also some, some uh, 
you know, negativity around uh, uh, some of these components in the microservices architecture. Some of the customers out there that I'm working with really struggled with it um, in terms of how to manage these uh, uh, concerns around tracing or distributed tracing. Because when you think about a microservices architecture, it's really a dislocated architecture. It's a remote architecture. And so the, along with that comes a, a very... Um, a big challenge around skilling up development teams around these, these additional concepts of logging and tracing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in the advent of microservices architectures, thank goodness we, we had some, some amazing development up in the community around platforms around this. So, you know, along came platforms like Kubernetes and OpenShift that can help with some of these concerns. So those are great platforms to run these types of architectures and systems on. Um, where they can help you with some of these uh, uh, fringe infrastructure support services around the microservices architecture. So if you quickly look at uh, a microservices architecture in terms of the components that would make it up, uh, we would potentially now as a runtime use something like Spring Boot uh, running an Apache Tomcat. We might be using the Spring Framework. Yes, of course, Apache Camel is still there, Spring Rest is there, but we had to kind of build our own um, components into our applications to take care of these uh, side infrastructure uh, responsibility constraints. So we had to use things like Hystrix and circuit breakers, et cetera, et cetera. And we had to take knowledge of those things inside of our applications. Um, and for, for those developers on the forefront that, that you know, understood these architectures, that was, that was okay. Um, but it very quickly spiraled out of control, um, especially with more junior developers uh, having to think about, you know, how do I code logging or um, routing and tracing into my application itself? So then uh, uh, in the last couple of years, we've been working more and more on what we and really, in the cloud native architecture, we have an infrastructure focused platform like Kubernetes or OpenShift, and we have application focused services. Um, so, and, and that is really what we want. We want the infrastructure to be concerned with infrastructure stuff, and we want developers developing applications to, to be focusing on the business problem at hand. And so, in came uh, concepts like uh, service meshes with projects like Istio. And of course, uh, as I've mentioned before, platforms like Kubernetes. So if we look at some of the ways that we could do cloud native architectures, again, we could use Camel on top of uh, Camel Spring Boot and deploy Spring Boot in a Tomcat container onto a Kubernetes platform. And we could use the service mesh to help us with uh, some of the concerns around that. Um, we could also just use Camel standalone. So we could use Camel onto the Camel main call alongside with the service mesh. So that's a different way of doing it. And then, of course, brand new to the game, we could uh, use Caucus and, and use the Camel Caucus project to deploy Camel onto Caucus, which is lightning fast and, and, and really uh, uses frugal resources in your Kubernetes or OpenShift cluster. Um, but Really, in a serverless architecture, if you if you want to get the best of it all, um, we we have a project called Camel K. So uh, uh, this is Camel developed for native Kubernetes. It runs on Kubernetes and OpenShift, um, and that alongside with if you've got the K native project enabled in your cluster, you really get the best of all of those worlds. And and I'll quickly explain in the following slides what I mean by that. So let's take a quick step back and, and just think about, you know, what are the requirements of a serverless architecture in the first place? So there's two kind of sets that I've put up here. There's, there's many more, but I just took the four most important ones from my point of view. So from a platform point of view, from, from Kubernetes or OpenShift or whatever else you are using, there's a couple of requirements that are almost non-negotiable, right? So the first thing is that your application or microservice needs to be able to scale to zero. So we do not want to deploy and run our application services in the cloud or in your private cloud um, and have it sit there and consuming resources, costing you money when there's no demand for that service. 
So it's very important for your service to be able to scale back to zero. Now, you might now be thinking, you know, yes, of course, you can take your job application server and, and shut it down. But think about when an incoming request comes in, how long does an app server take to respond or even Spring Boot? Um, it takes a long time for, for, for response. So we need a technology that can respond very quickly, but also scale to zero. Then the next thing is that we want to rapidly scale up and down. So you want to take one instance of your application service and scale it up to 10 or 100 or 1,000 very, very quickly with low resource consumption. And then, of course, you want to be able to scale it back down if the demand is not there for that service. Very, very important for the platform is that it needs to have an eventing mechanism and it needs to support routing and networking. From the application runtime point of view, it needs to be lightning fast at startup, but even more importantly, it needs to be very, very fast at that first response. So if you think about uh, a service scaling to zero, it's not ready, it's not live to take an incoming request, but when that request comes, it needs to start up and handle that request in a very short amount of time. Secondly, from an application runtime point of view, we want it to be very low on memory and CPU usage, because these are the things that are cost uh, factors in the cloud or on platforms like Kubernetes or OpenShift. And lastly, of course, we want it to be a small size on disk, not only for, for, for disk uh, size issues, but also for moving uh, these data around uh, having unified storage between your clusters. So, of course, these projects, like I've mentioned before, that can help you with this on the platform side, Kubernetes, OpenShift, and Knative. And on the application runtime run side, we have uh, CamelK and Caucus. What I quickly want to just talk about is the difference between API management and the service mesh. For those of you that are not familiar with either one of those, uh, I've, I've put links at the back of this talk so you can find out more of it. But these two worlds have really come together, API management being more an application-centric platform and service mesh being more an infrastructure-centric uh, platform. API management helps you with business and people-centric uh, things, so resources are APIs and endpoints. And you, so you can design and manage and control your APIs from an API management point of view. Um, and of course, from a service mesh point of view, um, you know, you can you can handle authentication, authorization, routing, tracking, all those kinds of things, control access and, and track usage, but from an infrastructure point of view. So just very quickly, in terms of a service mesh, it works on uh, this concept of a sidecar. So your pod would be running your service and you would have the sidecar called the Istio proxy that would be deployed alongside with your service. And that proxy would be uh, communicating to the control plane and the control plane would be the, the, the management mechanism that would be handling things like policy control and telemetry. And then how does API management and service mesh come together? So in Kubernetes and in the OpenShift platform, again, all of these things are available to you in community projects and available to use right now. We have got this concept in the control plane of, of the service mesh uh, called a mixer adapter that actually communicates with the API management backend. So, so there's bilateral communication and control between the two. Knative, this is all about serverless and eventing. Um, so there's a couple of projects uh, that, that we are working on and that is available within Kubernetes and OpenShift. The first one is Tekton. So if you are used to CI/CD pipelines with things like Jenkins, Tekton is a Kubernetes native CI-CD uh, mechanism and framework. So what it does is every single step in your CI-CD pipeline is serverless based on Knative. And uh, when that step executes, it, it quickly fires up, it does what it needs to do, and it goes away. Um, it's an event-driven model that serves a container and it can scale to zero. So think about this, your CI-CD server and all the steps in that is not some uh, a server running there consuming resources in your cloud, it scales to zero. And when you're running a CI-CD job, absolutely, it then kick, kicks off and, and does what it's supposed to do. 
So um, that is K-native. Uh, if you think about the expression uh, in YAML uh, around uh, the difference between doing a, a CRD in Kubernetes and expressing yourself in Kubernetes and doing it in K-native, it's a much more uh, uh, slim-lined approach. And you can see that just a sample uh, YAML file that I took from, from Kubernetes here, um, it's almost half uh, the lines in terms of configuration that, that you can express. Right, so how do we do this integration alongside with K-Native? So there's a, a project out there called Strimzy, and Strimzy really is uh, the heavy lifter in terms of making K-Native possible on Kubernetes. So you will have all of your source systems, you will use a Camel K to connect to them and to express yourself in terms of your integration needs. And then you'll push it through the Strimzy channel uh, over the K-Native platform um, and it will do what it needs to do. Right, so uh, you can see that in terms of, of uh, uh, the declaration of, of these different things, it's all YAML, it's very easy to understand, it's readable, um, and you, you really uh, express yourself through a Kubernetes resource definition in each one of these feds. So everything that we configure in Kubernetes is done through a CRD, a Kubernetes resource definition. And so uh, when we define things around our sources, our channels and our services, it's all around these CRDs. Then uh, I wanna talk a little bit about Camel K. So it's uh, really a, a very cool project, a sub project of Camel. And it's a platform for directly running integrations on platforms like Kubernetes and OpenShift. It's amazingly also based on the operator SDK. And I'll show you a little bit about that later. So there's a, a full-blown operator within uh, OpenShift where you can install Camel K. It will keep it up to date. It will help you with your deployments um, and it will automatically go into autopilot mode if you allow it to do that. It's Apache-based. It's a community-driven project like any everything else that I'm talking about today. It's all community-driven um, and, and it's been around since about 2008. So let's quickly think about this. So a nice way of expressing what is Camel K is that it's a lightweight integration platform. It's based on Apache Camel, but it's born on Kubernetes. So it's native to Kubernetes and it's got serverless superpowers. So it runs on vanilla Kubernetes. It runs on OpenShift and it, it, it gets most of its powers if you enable K-native on Kubernetes or K-native on OpenShift. That is when it's really at its best. So how does it do that? Number one, like I've uh, explained in the beginning, you can use your favorite language to express an integration file where you can say, well, take from uh, this Telegram bot uh, 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 and, and, and you know, push it to this Kafka topic and do this transformation that you express somewhere in your, in your, in your language file. Um, and uh, it will go and do that. And it will do that in a serverless manner, which is really great. It's very, very easy to run. So we've got this command line tool called Camel with a K. And you literally say Camel run um, integration.groovy and that uh, Camel uh, route will be deployed and run within your cluster, whether that is in your local cluster or on a remote cloud. Um, it will run that and, and that route will be available to, to accept connections. Right, so it will spin up those pods in Kubernetes and it will be available. And it uses frugal resources, which is what we wanted from the beginning. So if you, if you quickly think about how do I as a developer interact with Camel K, we have the Camel CLI, as I've just explained, that you will use on your laptop, uh, or if you're using a cloud IDE like uh, Code Ready Workspaces, you can use the Camel CLI to uh, make changes to your integration route and that will do a live update into your remote cloud or your local cloud, whichever one you are using. It does that again through a Kubernetes resource definition um, and the Camel K operator within uh, OpenShift or Kubernetes then picks up that CRD, applies the changes uh, to the running block. And it's really, really uh, fast to redeploy. It does that in less than a second. So if we quickly look at the metrics and, and this is why, and, and Camel K is so important for us. If we look at the difference, lower is better, by the way. Um, and 
if you think about uh, uh, the way we used to do it with source to image, uh, we had uh, uh, quite a long deployment time and redeployment time. If you think about the Fabric 8 Maven plugin, which is the other way that we would deploy camel routes or redeploy them into uh, uh, a cluster, they were significantly better. But uh, if you look at Camel K, first deployment is very, very quick and redeployments are even quicker. So that is, that is really amazing. Of course, Camel K is available on the Operator Hub. I've put the link to the Operator Hub at the end of these slides. Very, very easy to subscribe to that operator from within your cluster. Um, if you guys are not aware about what the Operator Hub is, this is a, 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 a website where we host all of the operators that are being written by Red Hat or third party vendors. Everybody puts their operators in there and you can, you can use them. And some companies even provide enterprise support around some of these operators. So it's very easy to deploy these operators into your, to your clusters. So let's move on to, to Camel Caucus. Um, and, and this old notion of everybody saying that, uh, you know, Java is, is slow and, and really uh, we've worked together with many other companies out there and, and many very good uh, developers and committers to, to kind of breathe new life into Java. And, and that's where Caucus was born. Um, so, so Caucus really is Java in 2020, lightning fast using frugal resources and ready for the cloud. If you look at the Java density problem and why we had to do this, if you think about a traditional cloud native Java stack, I'm specifically talking about Spring Boot here, the amount of Spring Boot services that you could fit into a particular size node um, is, is a lot less than, for instance, the amount of Node.js applications that you could fit in there, and even less so than the amount of uh, Go applications that you would be able to fit into that. So the Java world um, really had to shift gears for, for, for getting themselves cloud native and cloud ready, and that's exactly what we did with Caucus. So the Java for scaling problem, we had to figure out a way to scale up and scale down very quickly. And more importantly for Java to scale back down to zero. And so that's another uh, problem that Caucus uh, was tackling. So, so what is Caucus guys? Uh, and I'm supposed that some of you have played with this before. Again, the link is at the end. Caucus is a very cool project based on uh, 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 you know, uh, many uh, companies and, and, and open source committers working together to try and make Java relevant again. It's just won the Devis Award for 2020 and we are in the final three for the Cody's Award as well. Um, so they've got this uh, headline on the website calling it supersonic subatomic Java but really it is Kubernetes native Java and it's tailored for GraalVM and OpenJDK hotspot and it's crafted from the best of breed Java libraries and standards. So literally we have taken uh, Java and we've optimized it for Kubernetes um, and there's two modes. There's, uh, you can compile natively with GraalVM or you can use OpenJDK support um, to help you develop uh, your, your systems. So just in terms of a uh, differentiator, in terms of uh, the footprint, uh, if you read on the slide now, the traditional cloud native stack, that's a typical Spring Boot application. Uh, if you look at uh, a REST or a REST plus CRUD application, you can see the difference between running Caucus with OpenJDK. It's substantially less, almost half of the memory resources. But if you run Caucus with GraalVM in native mode, it absolutely smashes uh, the cloud native stack, uh, a tenth of the memory consumption. And then when you, when you look at the boot and first response time of this platform compared to something like a spring boot, you see that even Caucus with OpenJDK absolutely smashes uh, that cloud native stack. But when you go to Caucus and native with GraalVM, it is absolutely amazing. And this is what is so important about Caucus and the enabling abilities that Caucus will give to us is that it is super fast at scaling from zero back to one. It starts up in a frugal amount of time and it uses a lot less memory than any of the other stacks that we're using out there today. So this is great news for the Java world. 
So if we look at, at uh, a camel K with caucus, uh, this is just a screenshot that I took. Um, you can see that uh, a full-blown uh, application um, that, that uses uh, the timer log example uh, started up in 13 milliseconds, um, which is really, really fast. And it uses just about 16 um, uh, memory, megabytes of memory, uh, RSS memory, and, and 68 of, of the binary file size is 68 megs. So there's a lot of Camel Caucus demos. Unfortunately, for today's session, I don't have the time to do a demo, but I have linked at the end of the show, and you can also just reach out to me. I'm happy to jump onto a Zoom session at any point in time and, and, and take you through a demo. Um, but there's many demos out there that, that, that will just show you how amazing that technology is. Then moving on uh, to the Camel Kafka connector. Um, this is uh, really uh, Camel coming and, and joining forces with Kafka. So Kafka has got this uh, concept of connectors as how you interact with, with other systems. And for those of you that don't know what Apache Kafka is, it's literally a streaming platform, but it's a distributed streaming platform. Um, it's got a publish and subscriber messaging broker. Uh, and it's an ecosystem, right? So it's got many, many components that, that makes up Apache Kafka. It's got a lot of third party integrations. One of those integrations is Kafka Connect, and that is the one that we are using to integrate with Apache Camel. So let's have a look at what is Kafka Connect. So it's a framework that helps you to integrate Kafka with other systems. Uh, a user can obviously define the source and the sync connectors to stream data in and out of these Kafka brokers. These connectors are nice and pluggable, so you can use them, uh, uh, any of the many connectors available, you can write your own. Um, and, and if you have a third party vendor that, that's got some system, they can also write their own connectors. Um, the nice thing about Kafka is that it's distributed and scalable by default, meaning it's amazing for the cloud. Um, it does automatic offset management. Uh, it supports simple transformations uh, and it supports streaming and batch integration. So really the combination of, of, of Camel, which is that Swiss Army knife of integration and Kafka, which is the distributed uh, 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 streaming platform is, is really like a marriage uh, made in heaven. So let's have a look at what is the Kafka connector. So Kafka connector, it is built on top of the Apache Camel core. For us, it started as this internal proof of concept. It's now a full-blown sub-project of Apache Camel in the Apache Software Foundation. And it's been in the Apache Software Foundation since December of 2019. So, so last year, December, it got uh, into the, the ASF. And yes, it reuses, in a simple way, most of the Kafka Camel components as Kafka sync and source. So, so this is the important point. Is, we have this amazing integration framework and library in, in Apache Camel with over 300 connectors, et cetera, et cetera. And now we can literally through this Camel Kafka connector expose all of those Camel con uh, components as Kafka components, so Kafka sync and sources. So there's a couple of these connectors that are available today. Um, we are working, uh, these are the ones that we've tested the most, but we are continuously working uh, on these to, to try and, and, and get uh, more uh, of these connectors available to you. So there's a nice demo that you can guys can go and, and, and boot up yourself. It's very easy to get running. Um, and, 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 and it's just an example of, of how Camel K works with, with Kafka via Strimzy. So I've got about 10 minutes left in my talk, and I wanted to take you through some of these community projects just to show them you what they look like. But uh, really, if there's any questions at this point in time, I just want to take a couple of seconds or a minute here to pause and, and allow you guys to ask some questions, which I can then try and answer. Uh, thank you, Dexter Rotenbach. Uh, your question, the question is, uh, what does the licensing model look like? 
specifically for enterprises. So everything that I spoke about today, all these technology bits uh, are available in the upstream communities. You can download them, you can deploy them, you can use them free of charge. There's no cost associated to that. Um, the whole stack is available for that. But if you are in an enterprise and you need uh, enterprise support around that, Red Hat has got this whole stack covered in our enterprise products. And there's a subscription to to this as part of OpenShift and our Red Hat integration stack. So it runs on OpenShift and the whole Red Hat integration stack also runs on OpenShift. And you get access to all of these tools with full support from Red Hat if that is what you want. But again, if, if you're just playing around, if you don't need it mission critical, all of these things are available in the community for you to play with. And we've even got a, a lot of talks around that got a lot of examples as well. So if there is a model, please reach out to me directly if, if you need to find out more around our subscription model to this. Um, but, but it's really a cloud native model. So the question by Ahmad Kafar, and I, I apologize if I pronounce that incorrectly, is Apache Camel language agnostic? Is .NET supported? And thank you for the great presentation. Thank you so much, Ahmad. Um, Apache Camel in itself is written in Java. Um, the way that you can express Camel routes is you can do that via XML or Java or Kotlin or a lot of these languages. Um, so no, Apache Camel in itself is not language agnostic in terms of how we build the platform. But the whole point around Apache Camel is that it can integrate with literally any system out there. So if you've got a .NET uh, system and uh, uh, it's got some integration points, whether that is a web service or so, absolutely you can use Apache Camel to integrate with those .NET uh, 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 systems. Please reach out to me, Ahmad, uh, afterwards. We can have a chat around that and I can point you to some of, some of the resources. Okay, so uh, I'm going to just quickly use these last couple of minutes to take you through some of the websites of the technologies that I've spoken about today so that you can just make a mental note of how these uh, websites look. Um, and, and of course, the links are at the back of my, my session. If there's any questions that come through, please send them through. Um, I'll, I'll try and answer them at the end. So the very first uh, uh, website that I want to show you is YouTube actually and, and you can see that we've got the Dev Nation Tech Talks from Red Hat on here. They are not product focused, they are technology focused and this is like my go-to subscription channel on YouTube for technology. Here we talk about all the latest and greatest in the Kubernetes world. We talk about Caucus, Camel K, Tecton, AWS, everything that, that I believe a developer should be, should be you know, on the ball with today in 2020, you can find some amazing tech talks on this on this channel here. None of this is based on any vendor product. It's all technology based. So I do urge you to go and have a look at this uh, Dev Nation tech talks uh, on YouTube. The next project that I spoke about today is Kubernetes. You might all be familiar with it, but in, again, you can get Kubernetes straight from the website. Um, we also have from Red Hat a community version of OpenShift called OKD. It's absolutely free, but we've done all the integrations already for you. Um, so my advice always is if, if you want to have all these integrations already working for you, go and download OKD if you can't pay or your enterprise doesn't want to have an enterprise support. Mm. This is absolutely free and available for you to use. It's so amazing to, to, to just get going. Here we've got the Camel website, uh, which is there. You can download Camel from here as well. Of course, like I said, you can you can get Camel from uh, uh, the operator hub within uh, Kubernetes and OpenShift. Then we have a project called Synthesis, and Synthesis is a hybrid integration platform. It's a UI over all of these tools that will allow you to to visually create these Camel routes. So I think maybe to your point. You don't have to be a coder to code integration routes. You can use Synthesis, which is a nice drag and drop environment if you want to build your camel routes in that way. We have API Kiro, which is a design environment for uh, your APIs. So go and, and have a look at that. 
Then we've got Istio. I've spoken today about the service meshes. So Istio is, is the upstream community for the service mesh that runs on Kubernetes and OpenShift. We've got the Knative project, uh, which is uh, a, a lot of vendors working together to, to make serverless uh, a reality on, on, uh, on Kubernetes. Then we've got the Caucus website. Please go and check this out, guys. This is amazing technology. Um, you, will, you will not be uh, uh, disappointed with, with Caucus. It, it's really amazing. Um, if you look at Caucus, you can see that, that there's so many projects uh, that, is, that is actually integrating with, with Caucus today. Um, you, can, you can find your favorite technology and they, there's probably going to be a Caucus uh, uh, integration for it. You can find the API management solution, which is Freescale. It's now been fully open sourced by Red Hat. So this is available on GitHub. You can download it and use it free for use. Um, so that is available to you. Um, we've got the operator hub that I spoke about earlier on. So any of these technologies that you want to deploy to Kubernetes or OpenShift, please go and have a look on the operator hub. There might be a, an operator available for it. So let us just quickly have a look here for Camel K. There you can see the Camel K operator. It's available there as well as many of the other uh, 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 solutions that we have. Then we have Quay.io, which is a, a, a Docker uh, container repository that is available there for you for free. And, and then I have to point you to the developers.reda.com website. Guys, go there, there's tutorials, website. You can download all of the products and solutions from this website for free. All of the Red Hat stuff is available for developers for free. If you don't want to use for community stuff, you can get the actual enterprise bits here for free for development. So of course you can go to the community websites and download the stuff. There's no connotation to any vendor there, but if you want to use the, the enterprise bits, but you wanna just test it out, go to this website as well. You can get it there. Then uh, one of the things that I wanted to show you is uh, Code Ready Containers. And Code Ready Containers is a localized way of running OpenShift on your laptop. You can download it for free. It's free for use for developers. Go and check it out and you can run OpenShift on your uh, laptop. Um, then you've got Code Ready Studio. This is our code in the acquisition. This is a, a web uh, 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 or a development environment based on Eclipse that you can use. We've also got the Cloud Workspaces, which is uh, running Eclipse basically out from Kubernetes or OpenShift. It's a web-based IDE. You can surface it straight from your cluster and it's amazingly well uh, uh, thought out. So, so some very cool tools here, guys. You can reach out to me um, at any point in time if you want to need help. There's a, an OpenShift Odoo, OpenShift CLI for developers that you helps you rapidly build applications. And yes, so uh, that, is, that is it from my side. I want to thank each and every one of you today for, for joining in. Uh, listening to me uh, talking about these amazing technologies that is available out there for you guys. Please go out there, go and play with these things. There's a lot of uh, uh, demos. There's a lot of YouTube videos. There's a lot of uh, projects out there that you guys can, can, can consume. And, and, and if you're into committing back to these projects, please go and join some of these projects and help us make it better. Um, I thank you very much. Thank you for listening to me. Um, and, and please, uh, uh, if, if there's anything, do reach out to me. Thank you so much.